Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Michael Gomez. I'm a clinical child psychologist, and I'm going to be talking today a little bit about child mental illness and what it might look like in the classroom. A couple of things I want to go over today. First, there are really three broad types of child mental illness when we use that term. First one we call developmental disorders. These are things like autism, intellectual disability. Intellectual disability, by the way, is the, is the current name for what used to be called mental retardation. That one is a little bit beyond the scope of today's talk, but are still very important. Then you get broadly into what we call externalizing or internalizing disorders. Externalizing disorders, you've heard of and you've seen them in your classroom. This is ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, behavior problems, essentially. Those are kind of easy to spot, which is why I want to focus a little bit today on internalizing disorders. By definition, they're internal. You have heard of this as depression or anxiety disorders. And so since those are a little bit harder to spot, that's what I wanted to spend today on. And we're kind of going to use that paradigm of depression and anxiety. However, before I kind of go into that, I want to talk a little bit about what this might look like across the developmental lifespan or even just within kind of K through 12. And there's a very easy kind of rule of thumb I use. So for all intents and purposes, as a teacher, you're going to see basically three types of developmental stages from very young kids like preschool to your 12th graders or seniors in high school. And so for your toddlers and let's say first, second, maybe even third grade kids, they're in a stage that developmental psychologists call egocentric. <clears throat> and a very easy way to think about that is A plus B equals me. That's how we define egocentric, which defines a lot of toddlers and many 40-year-old men. Now, as you get into later elementary and maybe even your tweens, like your junior high kids, you get into concrete stage. And that's A plus B equals C. One of my mentors uh, said a good rule of thumb for this stage is, and I'd like you to do this, those of you who are watching this, look around your immediate environment. What, if you can't see it, it really isn't relevant for someone in concrete stage. Okay? So that comes in the next stage, which you get in your, maybe your junior high kids, but definitely in your high schoolers, which is abstract. And that's A plus B equals Y. And so at that point, they're having much more kind of abstract and conceptual thinking. It's not that it's impossible in the other stages. It's just that kind of what defines that stage. Now, the reason this is important is especially for that egocentric stage, that A plus B equals me, and a little bit for that concrete A plus B equals C. The, the thing about internalizing disorders is people talk about depression, anxiety, like different things. And, and in a way they are. But one way to think of depression, anxiety is two hands on one body. So depression and anxiety look like this for someone who's in high school and, and adults. But for younger kids, especially toddlers and your elementary kids, the hands start this way. And there's a very notable psychologist, uh, Thomas Achenbach, who has created a measure called the Child Behavior Checklist that he actually assesses not for anxiety or depression, but for an anxiety depression domain, which is actually a good way to think of it. They kind of collapse into each other. So pre-puberty, anxiety and depression look like this. As you hit puberty, they start doing that. They start branching off. So you can also think of a tree trunk that ends up branching off. Now, the reason, then they're never really too far apart. There's a term in psychology that we call comorbidity. Comorbidity is just a fancy term for if you have one mental illness, you might have another. So people who have depression have comorbid anxiety a lot of time and vice versa. People who have anxiety disorders often have comorbid depression. That's actually the reason why is because in terms of development of human beings, they start off like this. And some people, they just stay this way. For a lot of people post-puberty, they branch off, but they're never too far. It's still kind of the same tree. One kind of explicit example is something we call rumination. Rumination looks like problem solving from a first person perspective, but it's actually problem amplifying. So I'll give you an example, a teacher example. So here's a rumination cycle if you're in the process of reopening school, for example, during the pandemic. Here it is, a teacher at three in the morning. I don't know if it's gonna be safe and it might not be safe and I don't know if we have all our gear and I don't even know if we have all the disinfectant and what if we do and is the facial gonna work? And it looks like you're solving a problem, but you just probably made yourself more anxious or depressed or you know more sleep dysregulated. And so rumination is a good example of a symptom that occurs both in depression and anxiety. 
What I'd actually like to talk about now in this next section is how they look a little bit different, kind of what depression looks like for younger kids, what anxiety looks like for younger kids, and then kind of go across that, those three types of development. So let's start a little bit with depression. So in that A plus B equals me phase, those are your toddlers and kind of your early elementary. One real key thing for educators to keep in mind is that depression, even though when we say depression as adults, we usually mean sadness or things like that. As psychologists, we mean irritability. It can also mean sleep dysregulation. So that kid who's kind of nodding off in class, you might want to take an extra look at that kid and see how they're doing. Another one that can kind of define depression is flatness, just this kind of almost numbness. And these are kids who are very withdrawn. Um, these are kids who are just not really emoting. There's like, it's not that there's bad emotion, it's there's no emotion. And that actually might be depression, both in your A plus B equals me stage and your A plus B equals C stage. As you get a little older, as you get into high school, into A plus B equals Y stage, this looks a little more of what you think depression looks like. Sadness, hopelessness maybe on suicidal ideation, people thinking about hurting themselves. Now, one key thing to keep in mind for things like suicide, which is another whole talk, is that there's this big myth that if I, if I as an educator ask about that, I might make them do it, right? I mean, I just put the idea in their head. First, that idea was usually there a long time before you came along, so you didn't do it. Second, when researchers look at both children and adults who are, have suicide attempts, one of the key findings is that the people who had attempted suicide explicitly say, I really wish someone would have asked me or a variant is I would have told someone if they had asked me and I would have gotten help. So even just asking the question shows care and concern. It doesn't implant the idea in their head. Now with anxiety, let's start at that A plus B equals me stage. A big one is tension. Your kids who are like, especially kids who have like neck aches, headaches, tummy aches, chest pain, um, you have a little kindergartner, first grader, and it doesn't have a medical concern, like they don't have, for example, sickle cell or something, or they're not, you know, having the flu. And they have to keep going to the nurse's office because they have these tummy aches, but the mom is, says, hey, I took the Johnny to the pediatrician, he's okay. You might want to check in for an anxiety disorder because it can look like that. The term we call that is somatization, body-based pain. This is also a finding with people who are not European American, who are not Caucasian, is that some of our symptoms, if you're Latinx, African American, for example, might come out, your anxiety might come out in chest tension or headaches or stomach aches, and that goes well into adulthood. But it's a really good thing to check for your younger kids. Now for your A plus B equals C stage, you also want to look for ADHD looking symptoms. Kids who are anxious can look a little like this, you know, really fidgety, really jumpy, and they might also, in that concrete stage, be misinterpreting a lot of cues. So let's say you have little Billy who's very anxious and he's in fourth grade. Susie and Janie at the front of the class start giggling because they're talking about something. Since that's in his immediate environment, he's in concrete stage. He's going to think they're laughing at me, Billy. Now, that doesn't mean you, you stop, you know, Janie and Susie from, you know, being friends. It just means that you want to make sure you're checking in on kind of what concretely they're seeing there and also correcting it. And so that's a big part of what we do when we have treatment for these kids. Now, once you get into that A plus B equals Y stage, this one still can look a little bit like ADHD. It can look like panic or fear. But one thing I caution educators, especially high school teachers, check your high achievers. There is a really high level of kids who are like your 4.0 kids, National Honor Society, that they may be worrying a little more anxious, maybe even a little more depressed. Now, um, one of the jokes we have as psychologists is that um, people with anxiety make very, very good doctors. And that's because it focuses you and anxiety can be very helpful when done you know, strategically and in moderation. So it's a little bit like salt. Too much, you get a stroke, but the human body does need it. So it's not something to like get rid of or stomp down. It's more something to be aware of and making sure that it's not overwhelming them. And so I always caution teachers to look at your high achievers and just to check in. They may be totally fine, but just check in on those kids. Last thing I wanna go over for today. When I have teachers um, and I work with them, they ask me, well, what's, if you could do one thing, just give one piece of advice to an educator, what would it be? And I, my advice would be, even within this conversation is, always check for something we call adverse childhood experiences. If you type in ACE, A-C-E, and CDC, Center for Disease Control, 
you'll pop up the ACEs study, which is a very famous study in the, in the child trauma literature. And essentially an example of an ACE would be physical or sexual abuse. It could also be dad is a drinker or mom has bipolar or dad just was never there or mom is incarcerated or grandpa died. It could be any of those. So it's adversity in childhood. Adversity can really look a lot like depression, can look a lot like anxiety, and they will be experiencing those symptoms of muscle tension, stomach aches, panic, flatness, numbness. But if we just try to treat it as depression and not look at the, the history there, it might be um, basically you're dealing with the smoke instead of the fire. And one thing I always tell educators is that um, the majority of child fatalities from child abuse and neglect occur before the age of five. And it's almost 90%. And the reason is because teachers actually save lives. You probably don't need a PhD to know that a black eye on a seven-year-old is not because he ran into a wall. And so the reason the child fatality rate goes so low once kids start getting in school is because you are saving their lives. And that's because you're, you're aware of the possibility of adverse child experiences. Now, admittedly, this is not the job of an educator, but this is, is a good role for a school counselor, school psychologist. Um, and you can just say, hey, I'm, I'm really worried about Billy. Would you mind touching base with him sometime this week? He seems to be a little flat, uh, not, you know, nothing really gets him excited anymore. And, you know, they're usually really trained in how to do this. So that was a, a relatively quick run through, but I do appreciate your time and watching these videos. Uh, hopefully this was helpful. And again, I really appreciate our educators out there and all that they do for our children. So thank you very much. And I appreciate your time.